As the next step, we should discuss properties of our result, properties of the general U and the general W that we have found. So using our U variables, we can describe any loop integral with arbitrary numerators and denominators in terms of those two functions, which are now defined using reduced incidence matrices and so on. Let us look at some properties which are interesting in general, but also important for our renormalization purposes. The first property I want to look at is uh, yet another version to write those formulas. So I call that property A. So I claim that we can write down another matrix, which I call curly M, which is a block matrix. Zero in the left corner, then minus two times the reduced incidence matrix here, minus two times the transpose uh, down there, and minus four times the alpha matrix here. So what is that matrix? It has a matrix which has here V minus one lines, because for each uh, vertex minus one, there is a line. Then here we have a line for each internal uh, line. Then here again, we have V minus one columns for each of the vertices minus one. And here we have I columns for each of the internal lines of the Feynman diagram. So this is a matrix which we can construct. Now I claim our U is nothing but the determinant of this matrix M times minus four to the power of minus the internal lines. Furthermore, the W can be nicely written in a more compact form compared to here as P transpose U transpose as a, a row vector times the inverse m to the minus one times the vector p and u minus k prime. So this is a nice way to write it. It involves an inverse matrix, which is the inverse of a very big matrix with so many columns and rows, but the matrix is constructed in a quite clever way with uh, zeros and just the incidence matrix here in those blocks. So in some sense, it is a, a simpler expression than the one that we have over there. Let's prove that it is equivalent to what we had obtained before. Let's prove it here. So what is the determinant of this big matrix? First of all, the determinant can be obtained by multiplying in a tricky way this matrix by another matrix, namely this determinant of M times the following block matrix, which has a one here and a one over there and a zero block here. So it's a triangular matrix. So a triangular matrix, whatever I put here has always determinant one. Therefore, the determinant doesn't change by multiplying M by such a triangular matrix. And now I use a trick to put into this block down here, minus one half alpha to the minus one times B transpose. What happens if I multiply our matrix M by this triangular matrix? If I do it, then I obtain the following matrix. So in the left upper block, I obtain now minus two B times minus one half alpha to the minus one B transpose. This is nothing but our matrix A from at the top. So in this block, we get our matrix A. What do we obtain in the lower left block? In the lower left block, we obtain this row here times that column over there. So we get minus two B transpose 
minus 4 alpha times minus 1 half alpha to the minus 1 B transpose. So we get uh, 0 because the two terms cancel out and that was exactly why I constructed it this way. So we get a 0 block here. Here in the upper block we get something but we don't care. But what do we get in the lower block? In the lower block we obtain this row times that column, so times 1, so we get here minus 4 alpha. That means the determinant of m is equal to the determinant of this block diagonal matrix. Therefore, this is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of the matrix minus 4 alpha, and that proves exactly our first claim. So the claim for the U is now proven because uh, our U is the product of the two determinants up to the minus 4, and so out of this determinant we can factor out minus 4 to the power of number of rows or columns, which is I, so that explains this relative factor here. So we can also uh, have now a fourth way, or maybe a third or fourth way, to calculate our semantic polynomial U. So in the past we always had two ways, either with spanning trees or with the explicit formula using our normal determinant M. Now we have a way U as a product of two determinants or a product or one determinant of this very big matrix. Four ways to calculate U. Now about the W. This is just an explicit calculation. And uh, if, let me delete this here, just for simplicity, because that is now clear. But let us write down what you need to have in mind in order to prove the statement for the W. For that statement, you just need to bring the W as we have it over there into a form uh, of such a vector P transpose U transpose times a big matrix times a vector P and U. Okay, so what are the entries of this matrix? We can just read it off directly. So for example, the left upper entry is the prefactor of P transpose times P. So that is according to what we have over there, just A to the minus one. So then the entry on the top right of that matrix is the prefactor of P transpose times U. So the prefactor of P transpose times U is A to the minus one times minus one half B alpha to the minus one. And in the lower left block we have the transpose of this of course and then in the lower right block, we have the prefactor of U transpose times U. So that is a little bit more complicated. So we get here one over four, one over four in the lower right block times then alpha to the minus one B transpose A to the minus one B times alpha to the minus one. So this is the thing we obtain from u transpose times u from here, and then there is another u transpose times u from there, minus one over four, alpha to the minus one. So by brute force, you can bring that expression into a form, uh, column vector, uh, sorry, row vector, column vector times a matrix with those entries. And now what you simply need to do you can check by explicit calculation that if you multiply this matrix with that matrix here times M, then you have a multiplication of block matrices and that multiplication just gives the unit matrix. So you can directly check it. So for example, we can check one uh, entry as an example. So for example, uh, uh, whatever the lower right um, entry would be the product of a block matrix. Okay, I didn't write this, so let's multiply the upper line uh, with whatever um, this block here. That gives just minus one half a to the minus one b times alpha to the minus one times minus two b transpose. So the minus two and the minus one half cancels and what remains is A to the minus one times B alpha to the minus one times B transpose. 
but that product gives just A, so we get IA total minus one times A is the unit matrix. So you can check for yourself that the product of this times the M gives just the unit matrix. And that means uh, we have proven our statement here. Okay, so that's it. And here I forgot minus K prime, but that doesn't matter. So anyway, this is an alternative way to write our W and an alternative way to write our U. Okay, then let's go to the next property. Property B. W stays unchanged if we go for example to this subgraph of where variables. So if we replace P by a new set of momenta Q which is given by a rotation matrix or this determinant one matrix R times P and if we replace at the same time the incidence matrix B by something new B prime which is also given by R times B where determinant R is equal to uh, plus minus one. Okay, so if we do that, then W stays unchanged. And that means we can assume without loss of generality that we work with these sector or subgraph aware variables that we defined before. And then our momenta are defined in this uh, subgraph aware way. And the incidence matrix is uh, defined accordingly so that each row of the incidence matrix does not necessarily correspond to one vertex, but to an appropriate linear combination of vertices, like for the momentum. So that is our next property, and the proof is extremely simple. If we use the new representation in terms of the curly M inverse that we have just found. Because if we do that, then um, our W would change as follows. So P uh, transpose, U transpose changes to um, P transpose and U transpose times this matrix um, R transpose zero zero unit matrix and uh, the column vector changes accordingly with the matrix R of course and the matrix M changes um, by multiplying the incidence matrices with R or R transpose, so we can write it like this. M changes to um, R001 zero, zero, times M times R transpose 001. Zero, zero, and if we now multiply uh, the vectors P and U with the inverse of M, then these uh, factors with the R matrix just drop out. So that proves this property. That means we can use and assume sector and subgraph aware variables. Now, let us indeed start going back towards renormalization theory where we need to study subgraphs and properties of full graphs related to subgraphs. And that means also W's for the full graph compared to W's of the subgraph. We already had many questions and actually also some explicit examples where we computed W's and uh, U's for full graphs versus subgraphs and reduced graphs. And now we can start 
generalizing this and uh, deriving general properties which go into these directions. So let us start by considering subgraphs. So we give us a connected full graph G and a subgraph H, which is also connected, which is uh, not equal to the full graph. Then we imagine our variables for integrations where for the subgraphs we introduce rescaled variables and um, just make it a little bit simpler here, but in a way which is compatible to uh, the application in renormalization theory. So the alphas inside the subgraph are rescaled as t squared times uh, some betas and the alphas outside the subgraph, they just stay alphas uh, what they are. So in renormalization with labeled forests, we do it in a more complicated way, but it is compatible with this. So the main thing we want to look at is the dependence of the T-square, which is rescaling all the variables corresponding to one subgraph and studying the behavior of all quantities as a function of this rescaling variable T-square. So let's just note that this is compatible. with labeled forests. So our questions are, what is the T dependence of W and U? And what is the relationship between W, G, W, G over H, W, H, and the same for U, U for the full graph compared to U of the reduced graph and U of the subgraph. And remember that in the application we then introduced also functions D tilde, which are basically the U's but with the T's factored out, then the D tildes are regular and don't go to zero if T goes to zero, but uh, essentially we can also study it in terms of the U's. Okay, so for the following, um, I need to clean the blackboard first. So for the following, uh, I want to um, specify exactly what we do. So we assume now always these sector-specific variables which exist. And it's not a loss of generality to do it. And we also assume a suitable ordering of the lines and vertices to make notation a little bit easier. So that means the lines number one to IH, they belong to the subgraph. And also the vertices I to VH they are in the subgraph. And then the later lines uh, with higher numbers, they are outside of the subgraph. So as an example, I mean, you can imagine once again this Feynman graph where we now have these additional lines. Let's consider again uh, the obvious subgraph as H. Then we would now label the lines as follows. So the vertices for that subgraph are one and two and the vertices outside the subgraph are three and four. And then the lines in the subgraph are lines one and two, and the lines outside the subgraph are three, four, five. So that would be a way to label it. And then from our properties that we proved before for the incidence matrix, so this was this B property number K, we know that our reduced incidence matrix has this block form. Here the reduced incidence matrix for the subgraph H. Here a new quantity B sub HG, which is non-zero in general, but uh, it's um, not related to any graph itself. 
and here the reduced incidence matrix of the reduced graph G over H. So this is what we know. And we also know the alpha matrix, alpha, it's now a diagonal matrix, but it's still also a block matrix. Namely here in the upper block, we have the alphas, alpha one, up to alpha IH for the alphas in the subgraph. And then we have here alpha IH plus one, up to alpha I. So these are the alphas outside the subgraph. These are the alphas inside the subgraph. And so they will now be replaced by t squared times beta. So here we will have t squared times beta, and here the alphas just remain alphas. Then given all of this, our w can now be written using the new form in a very explicit way. So w is uh, first of all the following. We have our variables um, p, but now the p is replaced by subgraph aware variables. And let's distribute them. So we have one block, uh, variables q for the subgraph, then another block that we called qg, which is for the reduced graph g over h, if you remember. So that notation means variables corresponding to the uh, reduced graph g over h. Then we have the use, and the use can obviously also be split according to the lines in the subgraph and outside. So we have uh and uh corresponding to the use for g over h. Then we have our matrix inverse curly m to the power minus one, and here times the column vector q h, q g, u h, and u g. And so now what is our curly m in this block form? So it's a big block matrix, and here in the upper left block there was always zero, and in the upper right block we have minus two times the incidence matrix. The incidence matrix here has a zero, by the way. Um, let's write it. So it has here minus two bh, minus two bhg, which is an interesting non-zero quantity in general relating the full graph and uh, those subgraphs, here minus two b um, g over h, and here zero. And here we have the transpose of that one. And here we have the alpha matrix times minus four, so minus four block matrix alpha h, minus four block matrix alpha g over h. Zero, zero. So this is the block form of our matrix curly M. Okay, and now we want to make um, it a little bit more obvious what is the relationship between the full graphs and all these subgraphs. And the way it appears here in the formula by construction is a little bit um, overcomplicated. The best would be to reverse these two entries here, right? So let's reverse now these two entries. So our column vector is redefined by exchanging those. We also exchange those here, and we exchange the appropriate lines and rows in the block matrix. Then the product of all this is the same as before, but what happens is that then we have collected Q and U for the subgraph, Q and U for the reduced graph here as well, and then our blocks correspond not anymore to Qs and to Us, but the blocks correspond to the subgraph H and to the reduced graph G over H. So that would be very nice. So let's just exchange this. That gives a redefined curly M in terms of this uh, exchanged basis. So let's just say we have a new basis, which would be Q H U H Q G U G. 
but in terms of this new basis and uh, the redefined M where the blocks are interchanged in a suitable way, W and U, of course, stay the same. So on the next blackboard, I just want to write down how this looks like in order to visualize it. And then from now on, we will only use this exchanged way to write it because then we can really treat subgraphs and reduced graphs and compare them to the full graph. So we are in the process of reordering the rows and columns of our block matrices. And let me write down the result. So it is from now on useful to reorder our matrices such that we obtain W is equal to QH and UH transpose, then QG and UG transpose. So we have ordered according to subgraph and reduced graph variables. Then a new m to the minus 1, but I don't change the notation. Let's just keep m to the minus 1, curly m. QH, UH, QG, UG. And now our matrix curly m has the following log form. Just reshuffling those lines, so that goes here, uh, that goes here, and so on. And uh, then we obtain zero. Here in the next block, we have now minus 2b, and this is minus 2bh. Then we have a zero, and then we have minus 2bhg. Then in the next line, we have here minus 2bh transpose after the reshuffling. And here the alpha goes here, minus 4 alpha h. Then uh, here we have zeros. So those uh, zeros come from here by exchanging this. And that zero goes here, so we have here many zeros. Here in the lower block, we have zero, 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 and here the transpose minus two B H G transpose. And here in this block, uh, we have that alpha, and uh, those Bs go here. So zero minus two B G over H minus two B G over H transpose and minus four alpha G. So, it is a big block matrix with three shuffled blocks, but hopefully you see now what nice structure has emerged because clearly by going over to this basis of subgraphs, here in this block, we have exactly the curly M corresponding to the subgraph. So here we have immediately a curly M for the subgraph H. Minus 2BH, minus 2BH transpose, minus 4 alpha H. Here we have the curly M for the reduced graph because the alphas of the lines outside the subgraph are exactly the alphas for the reduced graph. M curly M, G over H. And we have already... Uh, proven that those here correspond to the incidence matrices of the reduced graph. So that is very beautiful. And here in the upper block, we have 0, 0, 0, minus 2, B, H, G uh, matrix. And here 0, 0, 0, minus 2, B, H, G transpose. And now we have one very beautiful result because we have identified the precise relationship between the full graph and the subgraph and the reduced graph. Because here, in terms of our curly M, in this reordered basis, we see the blocks of the curly M's for the uh, subgraph and the reduced graph, plus a small additional term at the off-diagonal blocks, even with many zeros in that block. But this single quantity is the difference between the full graph and the product 
of the reduced and the subgraphs. And this can now be used to make precise all those statements that we need between uh, these various levels of the graphs. So let's give that a frame as well. And that we can now use as a new um, um, let's say description of the full graph, the subgraph, and the reduced graph. And let's call this description in terms of this basis and this curly M and those variables, let's call it star. And everything else that we need for renormalization should be done, of course, in terms of this basis and this description, because that is exactly what we need in order to prove the appropriate relationships. So we have a very beautiful starting point, and now I will end the lecture just by proving yet another few properties that follow immediately from this representation. And those properties will already explain a lot of those relationships that we have encountered in concrete examples before. Okay, so from now on we will use these subgraph aware variables in this way of writing the curly M and our W and of course also the semantic polynomial U. Now I want to prove uh, what I will call a lemma. Um, the lemma is inspired by the paper by Brighton, Lona, Meison and also by our uh, collaboration which uh, uh, resulted in, in such um, properties and uh, it will build on that. So in the following let us prove a lemma with a few details. Lemma on curly M, W and U for the full graph and its relation to the subgraph. And that lemma is of course specific to this notation star defined just above. Okay. Part A of the lemma is the following. After we replace the subgraph variables alpha by t square times betas for the subgraph, we get the following. What do we get? Our curly M becomes just as a block matrix. So uh, it's written over there explicitly. And where is the t-dependence of our curly M in that new notation? The t-dependence resides only in this block here where we get minus 4 t squared times the new variables beta h. And just let me denote it like this that all the other blocks are unchanged compared to what we have at the blackboard over there. So t square is located here. But now let me do a trick. Let's write this in the following way. Matrix t to the minus 1, t 1, 1 as a block matrix in this block structure times another matrix m tilde times t to the minus 1, t 1, 1 in terms of this block structure. So in other words, the m tilde is obtained by multiplying with the inverse of that. And that means eventually that we multiply here each row. Uh, so the second row and the second column is multiplied by 1 over t. And the first column and the first row is multiplied by t. And what do we get in this way? We get a new m curly m tilde matrix. And this M tilde matrix has now the following entries. So since the second column is multiplied by 1 over t, so here we have just minus 4 times beta h. So the t is absorbed in this matrix multiplication. Um, then uh, those entries here, those entries uh, are in the first row and second column. They get multiplied once with t to the minus 1 and once with t to the 1. So they are eventually unchanged. That is all unchanged. 
So here that would be multiplied with t to the minus one, but we have a zero there, so it's also unchanged. So that is all unchanged, 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 unchanged. But what changes is those entries which are in the first row, but not in the second column. So and there we have just this minus two times beta uh, bhg. And this quantity now gets an additional factor times t. So after uh, absorbing the t from here, in terms of this diagonal t matrix, we uh, get a relative t factor here and also down there. Minus 2 bhg transpose times t. This is nice and interesting because now we have factored out the t like we always wanted and like we always did in explicit calculations. So if we remember our block structure, then we have here our block for the subgraph and that block has now no t anymore, so we have factored out the t completely. That block for the reduced graph is completely independent of t from the beginning, but now we see that the t is localized in this difference matrix element, which uh, denotes the difference between the full graph and the product of the subgraph and the reduced graph. And so now we see here that this is in so certain sense of higher order in T. And that explains that previously when we did derivatives with respect to T or a set T to zero, then we always got some simplifications and we could relate the full graph to just the subgraph and the reduced graph. And this makes this kind of manifest. Even though there is still a non-trivial t-dependence because of those matrices, but since these are diagonal matrices, we can quite easily treat them in a separate way. And because of this, we will now introduce another notation, namely this one. Write this as m hat plus t times this matrix curly bhg, and what I mean by this is that the m hat just contains the diagonal blocks and the curly b contains those off-diagonal block elements uh, where the t is factored out. And then we make manifest the decomposition of the full graph into the subgraph and the reduced graph and, and uh, the higher order terms in t. So this m hat is just this. Um, curly M for the subgraph, then zero blocks here, and curly M for the reduced graph. So our lemma is that we can, in these variables, represent our matrix M in this way, and there is nothing to prove because we have just uh, discussed how it arises. So we factor out the T in terms of this diagonal matrix, and then we obtain a structure so that our fundamental curly M is written as a product of some diagonal T matrix times a block diagonal matrix which directly corresponds to subgraph and reduced graph plus higher order terms which are off diagonal in terms of those blocks. So this should definitely be a very nice and useful structure. Let's give it a frame. This is the first part of our lemma. Let us now go on. By the way, here I wrote some examples just to remind you, this is how the W and the, the D tilde looks like for this two-loop graph, and you see, and we saw in explicit calculations, how it depends on higher orders in T, and how the higher orders in T give rise to uh, this factorized structure. And we have seen this now arising in a general way. The next part of this lemma, lemma B, is on the U's. So U for the full graph can now be written using all of this as T, this variable T for the subgraph to the power two times the loop number of the subgraph, as we uh, are used to, times this UH which now only depends on the betas of the subgraph times u of the reduced graph, which depends on all the alphas, 
plus higher orders in T. That corresponds precisely to the structure that we found in our explicit calculation, d tilde for the full graph is d tilde for the subgraph times d tilde for the reduced graph plus higher orders in t. So this is now the lemma. So this is now rediscovered. We proved this already in general. See our section 331. But here we can prove it once again. How would we prove it here? Very easy. So our determinant of the curly M gives our U. But what can we now do with our determinant of M? Determinant of M is now the determinant of this T matrix minus T, T, 1, 1 in terms of this block. This T matrix appears twice in the product, so we get its determinant squared times the determinant of the curly M, which is the one in the middle. But what is the determinant of this? So we have to think in terms of the blocks. So this is not just the product of the entries, but this here is a submatrix, uh, which corresponds to V minus one rows and columns. This is a submatrix which corresponds, so VH, sorry, VH of the subgraph, minus one rows and columns. This is um, the block which corresponds to the U variables of the subgraph, so it has as many rows and columns as there are lines in the subgraph. Therefore, the determinant of this matrix, and by the way, I always write minus T, but I mean T to the power minus one. T to the power minus one. So what we get from the determinant is T to the power minus one to this, this power, so T to the minus VH plus one times t to the power ih, and all of that squared, and then times the determinant of m tilde. So, but what is this? This is now t to the power i minus vh plus one, which is exactly the loop number in the subgraph, times two, so this is exactly this t factor to that power times the determinant of m tilde, and m tilde is now, um, uh, if you set t to zero, it's just the determinant of m hat, which is the product of those two determinants, which are independent of t, plus obviously higher orders in t. So this directly gives us the result, QED. Very nice. So in this setup, all of this comes to us very naturally. So I deleted the proof here, but let us just go on with our next part of the lemma. Lemma C, and uh, we can directly compute a few properties without uh, separate proofs, um, but I want to record all of our intermediate results now as part of the lemma, since we uh, find everything useful. So, first of all, in this uh, notation we can introduce a shortcut. So let's just call this matrix here capital T. Then we can write curly M as T times curly M tilde times T again. And our M tilde is now M hat plus T times the matrix curly BHG, which is this off-diagonal block only. And we can write this as Um, yeah, as M hat times matrix multiplication times unit matrix plus M hat to the power minus one times T BHG. Just by brute force, we can write it like this. But we may now introduce an abbreviation for this extra term. Let's call it minus a matrix X then this is just m hat times one minus x as a matrix. And so then we can write our inverse m tilde to the power minus one is then the inverse one minus x to the power minus one times m hat to the power minus one 
and that can be written as a geometric series, so sum over n bigger or equal than zero, x to the power n times m hat to the power minus one. So the geometric series is also um, correct for matrix inversion. So that is a nice way to express our m tilde to the power minus one. And the nice thing is that this m hat is now independent of the variable t, and x is exactly t to the power one. Therefore, this is really a power series in the variable t. It has a lowest order in t and a higher orders in t. So we can write this as the lowest order is just m hat to the power minus one plus higher orders in t. So each power of x brings in one power of t. And so we can actually write this as the lowest order m hat to the power minus one plus higher order terms and let's give them a name, let's uh, call them S. So capital S are now all the higher order terms. So in other words, S is the remainder here, it's the sum of n bigger or equal than one times x to the power n times m hat to the power minus one. And uh, just to make it very explicit, this is n bigger or equal than one of the following. So we have here, this is minus x, so minus t to the power n, which is bigger or equal than one, and then m hat to the minus one, the off-diagonal matrix BHG to the power n times m to the minus one. So we have such a product. So if you plug in any value of n, you get a series m hat b, m hat b, m hat b, m hat, and so on, okay, to the power t to the n. This is our lemma C, so we have all these intermediate results and all these expressions which uh, illustrate the T dependence of our fundamental ma matrix M decomposed uh, further and further into its um, ingredients. And finally, we can put in for sure here lemma D, which is then the final result of today, namely, Plugging in our value for m and m inverse into the formula for w, we get now an expression. Our full w is given by wh plus wg over h plus ws. Now wh is exactly the w for our subgraph. wg over h is the w for the reduced graph. And this is an extra term. Just a five minutes ago, I had here the expression for our two-loop example, where we had such an expression. You can look it up, um, and you find exactly this relationship for t equals zero. So this is proportional to t to the power two number of loops in the subgraph. This is independent of t. And this is also of higher orders in t least order t or higher, according to its definition. So what is now the definition of this extra term? So it comes from um, plugging into the formula QH, UH, transpose, QG, UG, transpose, times matrix inversion, times the vector, So here, the full W has here m to the minus one. Now the m to the minus one is now decomposed into t times m tilde times t, and the m tilde is decomposed into m hat plus s. So the lemma is proven by plugging in this representation for the m inverse. So the m inverse now contains uh, this block matrix, which gives us directly the W for the subgraph and the W for the reduced graph. If you plug in this block matrix between these two, then you get WH plus WG over H. And what remains is the matrix S between these two. So you get here, including also the T's, T to the minus one times S 
times t to the minus one. Where s is this matrix of higher order in t, and t is the diagonal matrix involving only t's and ones on the diagonal. So there is nothing else to prove, but this is now a very powerful result, which is the basis of our general calculations. So remember in the last lecture and in the last uh, several lectures, in fact, we did several example calculations of concrete two-loop diagrams, comparing them to sub-diagrams and reduced diagrams, and we found manifold relationships what happens if we put t to zero, then the u's simplify and the w's simplify and can be related to either this or that. And even if we take the derivative with respect to t at t equals zero, we could relate our derivative of w to terms involving those two expressions. And here we have now the generalization of all of that. And this should be used in general renormalization proofs. <coughs> 